Good morning, family. God bless you. Let's worship God today, okay? shadows deepen we do but do you know that all the dark will stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made new we do it's so creative
my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comfort. He's a good father.
Everything changes around you. Thank you. We praise you. You're welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. Come and abide in our hearts. Sit on the throne of our hearts. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Father. The 
atmosphere is changing now yeah. for the spirit of the lord is here the evidence is all around yes the spirit Our Lord and Savior, a big hand clap again. There is nothing like the presence of God, and we're just so grateful to have him here this morning as well as you guys. It's always a blessing, family, to be here to lift up the name of Jesus, especially with beautiful songs like that that's just full of the word. Amen? Amen. For everybody that's joining us online, we want to thank you guys for joining us, and welcome to the service as well. Now, by a show of hands, is there anybody here this morning for the very first time you've never ever been to a service here at CORE, if you could raise your hand for me. God bless you in the back. Thank you for being here. 
Listen, the ushers are going to give you a welcome card. If you could fill that information out, we'd be really blessed to know that you were here with us this morning for the first time. You can put it in the offering as it goes by, or there are two boxes in the lobby. There's one by the information booth, and there's also one by the main exit where you come in. And if you're online, please take a moment and click on the welcome button there. We'd love to know that this is your first time with us on a live stream. And on behalf of Pastor Steve and his wife, Lori, Pastor Steve, our uh, senior pastor, we just want to welcome you guys this morning. Let's give them a big hand clap guys <laughs> praise God we just have a few quick announcements this morning uh as you know we said on um we mentioned it last week but on November 19th next month November 19th that's going to be a Saturday we're going to be having our fall fest from 12 p.m to 1 p.m it's for the whole church but we're also using it as an outreach to the community back but we want to invite you guys to come out and have a great time. And uh, if, if you've, who's been to the Fall Fest before? Anybody ever been to one? You, can, you guys can attest that it was a really, really great time. It was just primarily ministry that time to the neighborhood. But we want to be a blessing to the church as well this week with you guys. But we also need help with that. So if you're able to volunteer, we need about 100 strong for that day because it's going to be a huge operation. Food, the jumpers, face paintings, uh, all this kind of cool stuff for the kids. So if you're able to do that, and we hope that you are, we know that you can because you guys are such a great congregation, you can sign up at the information booth out there. I'll be out there. You can leave us your, you know, your email address, your phone number, and we're going to start organizing that really quickly here in the next a uh, few weeks. So if you are able to do that, we'd love to have you be a part of that day. And it's only like four hours, so we just want to have a few shifts so you can actually enjoy the day as well. Then secondly, we've had the Christmas child, uh, uh, the shoebox thing going on. So uh, if you have not picked up your box, please go out and pick up one. We're only giving out one at a time. So as you bring it back in, we'll give you another box. But please be a blessing to these kids because I'm telling you, it just touches their hearts and it's such a great ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ when they get these boxes, when we send them over there to these impoverished nations. Amen. And then lastly, November 8th is rolling around, folks. Uh, not telling you who to vote for, but we always do print up information for everyone. So you can pick this up at the information booth. It just gives all the details about what's going on and who's running and all that good stuff. So if you want some information on that, we've got that available in the lobby for you at the information booth as well. Amen? Now, if you're going to be worshiping the Lord today in the tithe and offering, the ushers will be down in just a moment. But you can also text Core Church LA, all one word, to 77977. You guys online, please feel free to do the very same thing. Or just click on the button there that says click here to worship the Lord in the tithe and the offering. With that, I want to invite the ushers down and we'll pray. Father, we are just so very glad to be here this morning to worship you. And as that song said, God, the atmosphere is just rich and thick, Lord, with your presence. God, we're honored to serve you this morning. Even in the tithe and offering, Lord, we thank you that you provided for your people. We lift this offering up to you and ask you to bless it, Lord. And we just give you praise and glory and honor for continuing to allow Core Church to minister your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. that in the name of Jesus there is power and healing. We break every stronghold, Lord. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. you 
believe it, sing it with me. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every fear, anxiety, to every song. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every strong Speak Jesus. We speak your holy name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Sing it out. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. Speak the holy name, Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. Jesus from the mountain, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my Bless you, family.
Wait, oh, hold on, there's no sleeping on the job here. We gotta be ready and willing to go at all times. No. Anyway, hey, this is Pastor Steve Wilbur, Court Church, Los Angeles, but I'm not actually here right now because I'm back on vacation. So anyway, in my place is a very dear friend of mine, Pastor Greg Denham. In fact, we've been friends for so long, I can't even remember how long we've been friends. But he's been here once before, and you're so going to be blessed with him coming back again here this morning. So let's give a great core church welcome to Pastor Greg Denham. Yay! Good morning, everybody. I'm so happy to be here, and uh, I love Pastor Steve. And as he was mentioning, we have known, well, we're family friends, actually, and, uh, and our family loves Pastor Steve. You guys, I'm excited about this morning. Grab your Bibles and let's turn to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. We're also going to be in Isaiah chapter 2 as well. So we're going to be looking at a couple different passages, and, and I'm so glad that you're here this morning. You guys, this is a big heavy, important, insightful, encouraging, life-changing message. I'm convinced of it. The title of the message is Armageddon, Antichrist, and Jesus Christ. It's actually really important to, to understand the big picture. You know, etched in the dome of the Capitol building in Washington is a statement which says, one far-off divine event toward which the whole creation moves. And a visitor asked an official, well, what does that mean? And the official said, it refers to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And let me just say that again. Etched in the dome of the Capitol building in Washington is this statement that refers to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The idea that everything is moving towards him. Nothing is going to stop it. It's going to be the greatest I told you so in history. And if you notice here in Revelation 16, verse 15, Jesus said, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 27, For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. When Jesus ascended to heaven, the angel said he's going to come back in like manner. As you saw him go into heaven, he's actually going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. And of course, how many of you had a curiosity? I know, I'm asking a rhetorical question, but I want to see a show of hands. How many of you have received communion before? Could you raise your hand, right? So the bread, symbolic of the body of Jesus, the cup, symbolic of his blood. When we do that, like we are celebrating the past work of Jesus, his present work, because he's in his church. And then we're also celebrating his future work. The question is, what does the second coming of Jesus mean? Very important question. Is it the end of the world? No. Is it doom and gloom? Actually, no. It's a rescue, actually. In fact, Jesus said, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would survive. And here's what ends up happening. We're talking about this. It brings two realities front and center. One is the reality of what's called Armageddon. Like our president recently made reference to Armageddon when he was referring to Vladimir Putin, his threats of nuclear war. So he says, oh, we're facing an Armageddon. Actually, you know, that's, it's, Armageddon doesn't have to do with anything taking place with Russia and Ukraine. We're going to learn in just a little bit. Armageddon has to do with Jerusalem. We'll get to it in just a little bit. There's actually forces, demonic forces actually, that want to replace the Lord God of Israel, the Davidic King, the Messiah, and there's going to be a leader, we'll talk about it, who will present himself as God in the temple of God. Armageddon has to do with Jerusalem, doesn't have to do with Europe. So important we understand it. And it brings the subject of Antichrist up. It's very important we're clear on this. You guys, please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 2, would you? And we're actually going to go back to Revelation in just a little bit. But I want to get a running start. I love this passage, Isaiah 2. Here's a snapshot of what it's going to look like when Jesus is ruling on planet Earth. 
It's a beautiful picture, Isaiah chapter 2. Now, this is written prior to when Jesus came. Okay, so the first time, came first to bear the cross. He's coming again to wear the crown of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And in verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 2, it says, Now it shall come pass in the latter days. So we're talking about, of course, in the future, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. Note this, all the nations shall flow to it. Whoa! One day, Jesus reigning. One day, the nations recognizing he's been the king all along. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Israel. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. Here's what I want to get to you guys. Note this, for out of Zion, so this is Jerusalem, shall go forth the, can someone tell me that next word, the law. The law? Yeah, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Like, what do you think of when you think of law? I was recently pulled over by a police officer, to be frank with you, and I was written up a ticket, right, because I was holding this iPhone right here. In my, and so, and, and then I, after, after I drove away, and I'm thinking, this is going to cost me money. Ay, ay, ay. So anyways, as I'm driving away, I think, you know, I thank God for a law. Because the police officers should embody the law. Law speaks of boundaries that protect us and our purpose to bless us, right? So it's like, yeah, it makes sense. You know, I shouldn't be driving with one hand and have this and the other, even though I wasn't texting and I wasn't talking on the phone. I really, I promise you, I was just really quick. Anyways, so the law is good. Law is good. Righteous law is good. Okay, but there is such a thing as unrighteous law. Did you know that? You know in the famous movie, The Nuremberg Trials, which tried Nazi leadership, so I see there's some youngsters out there. You're talking about like Hitler's henchmen, right? You've heard of Hitler. Bad guys. And uh, who corrupted Germany, who uh, impacted Europe, who was threatening the entire world. Long story short, the most famous judge in Germany, he's quite a scholar, his name is Ernst Janning, he allowed compromises in Germany that ended up morphing, metastasizing, impacting Germany, you know, leading to millions of people's lives being taken. But he just opened the door a little bit to compromise. Anyways, he's later after the war, he's on trial and there was an American judge that was leading the Nuremberg trials. His name was Dan Haywood. Well, Dan and others sentenced Ertz Yawning. He was very, as I said, a scholarly man, wrote a bunch of books, but he compromised and he opened the door to this morphing reality. And he wanted to, he wanted to talk to, the, to Dan Haywood, the American judge, in prison as as he was leaving, the Nuremberg trials were over. And this is what Ernst Yawning said. He said, those people, those millions of people, he's referring to, like to our, our precious Jewish friends, the Holocaust, I never knew it would come to that. You must believe it. You must believe it. And Judge Dan Hayward said, Er Yawning, it came to that the first time you sentenced a man to death, you knew to be innocent. In other words, once you open the door to compromise, okay, it leads to, to break down. All right, or look, or, you know, I'm preoccupied with my phone, I get distracted, I cross the line, I hurt an innocent person. It's not good. Laws are important. Can I hear a big amen to that? Really important. No, it's true. Okay, but not all laws are righteous. Just because Congress, for example, enacts a law or California passes law to indoctrinate children with sexual immorality. I come from San Diego. Our supervisors changed the meaning of a female. Okay, it made it law locally. Doesn't make it right. Whoa, I almost knocked that over. So sorry. I'm used to hitting my own ball then. Okay, doesn't make, listen, it doesn't make it right. You have to understand, those who enact unrighteous law that opens the door to compromise and morphing, metastasizing and breakdown, hear me, we'll stand before God one day. Okay, look, God is a righteous judge. You want that. Out of Zion goes forth the law. 
the law. Like, what are we talking about? Well, actually, technically, you're talking about the first five books of the Bible. Like, for example, let me just say what the law is. The law is the first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, there's a God, uncreated one. You're not a byproduct of mindless nature. It's not as if we came from nothing, we are nothing, we're headed nowhere. No, 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 no. No, there, there's a God who made us and created us, and when he did, he said it's good. How beautiful is that? The law reveals that God made male and female to make three. It's like my precious wife, we've been married 35 years. The Lord blessed us with four children. Now we have six grandchildren, one is on the way, and I have four grandsons and two granddaughters. Granddaughters are extra special, I'm just saying. Anyways, but... Um, Okay, so you have a male, you have a female, okay, with the potential for what? Life? Triune, male, female, baby. Triune in nature, if you will. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're created in the image of God. So it's like, hey, if you buck the law, if you, like, just, you know, shake your fist at the law, what are you doing? Well, up to this point, you're saying, that there's no God, and at this point you're saying, no, God didn't make male and female to make three. The law reveals God's plan through Abraham that the whole world would be blessed. That's God's law. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the Messiah of Israel to impact the entire world. The law reveals that God hates totalitarianism. He confronted the dictator Pharaoh, delivering the children of Israel out of enslavement, a prophecy of the future work of Jesus Christ impacting the world. Look, God hates when a man or a woman, when a few control others, just like, just like Putin is doing in Russia. A dictator hates it. He delivered the children of Israel out of the totalitarian play in Israel. By the way, Jesus gave his life on the cross to the day 1,300 years after the children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt. It's called Passover. The law reveals that God never wanted Israel to forget Passover. It was a preview and prophecy of a greater deliverance. That's the law. The law reveals God's original design for what is right and wrong. God gave 10 commandments, have First allegiance, God, honor mom and dad, no murder, devaluing a fellow man. God made black, white, big, small. We made us in his image, every human being intrinsically evil. Don't take the life, innocent life of another human being. Can I hear an amen to that, right? That's all, okay. So here's the point. Yeah, you can clap if you like. It's true. That's God's law. Okay, point number one. I'm not sure we have it on the screen, but here's point number one. God's law which is righteous standards and original design, our purpose to inform our thinking, to impact our lifestyle, to determine our identity. That's why Psalm 1, which is like the door of the Psalms that shaped the psyche of Israel, says, look, don't, don't be informed by godless information. It will impact the way you live. It will impact your identity. Instead, meditate on the law. Now, you guys, we're going somewhere here and laying a little foundation, but let me just say the law reveals the first move of evil. Demonic influence was to Eve. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? It was an attempt to undermine trust in God and undermine God's boundaries that protect and bless our lives. So in this way, it was like lawlessness. It's like, you sure you can trust the Heavenly Father? Go outside of original design. Your eyes will be open. You'll be like God. That was the lie of the Garden of Eden. It was the lie to move one to lawlessness. And the Bible says, the Spirit expressly says in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. It's like, oh, that's pretty heavy. Yeah. I mean, can we be informed by information that is contrary to God? Yes. And today we see doctrines of lawlessness on steroids, man. I mean, listen, there's been genocides in the past. It's like we pause 
and we remember our Jewish friends in the Holocaust. Can I hear an amen to that, right? It's like, that's just demonic. Well, look, today there's lawlessness. It's, on, it's just to the basic biological reality to create a context positioning man as God behind of which there's demonic influence to, dis, to inspire an alternate reality. Today, you're seeing the lie of, hey, did God really say you're male or female? The very basic construct of life. I have a friend, Victor Marx. He's a great man. And uh, he travels the world, and he goes to war-torn places. You should look him up, and he's a great believer. And he fights for women taken by ISIS and crazy groups. And, I mean, he's been in battles, and he travels with his dog named Scout, who's very, very highly trained, right, to, to fight the bad guys. Like, I kid you not, right? And, um, and, and, and they, they're at, they're, they travel the world. They rescue, as I said, women. It's beautiful. And so he was in an airport, and Scout, you know, has this sign on him, you know, please don't touch me or pet me or anything, because he's just, like, highly trained. And so there was a woman that approached and said, can I... Can I pet your dog? And he says, okay, sure, sure. You know, even though it does, you're not to pet, but of course, yes, you can. So she petted the dog. And then there's this guy that came and said, can I pet your dog? He goes, sir, I'm so sorry. But actually, um, he's, he's highly trained not to trust men. And this is a true story. And the guy goes, what are you talking about? This is an airport. What? I'm offended you call me a man. How do you know I'm a man? He says, sir, I don't want any trouble here. I'm, you know, it's like, no. So the guy starts elevating his voice. And he's, and he's like, you know, I'm offended. You call me a man. And then after a while, uh, my friend said, well, if you want to, if you want to go ahead and pet, you may, get, you may go for it, right? The guy backed off. He didn't pet the dog, right? So I kind of flushed out. But that, that's a true story. And yet it's a joke too. And it didn't go over very well. But anyways, the idea is he backed off, right? It's like, this dog recognizes men. Anyways, okay. Um, survey reveals that today, and this is like, look, just speaking reality, I'm a dad and a grandfather and believer in the Word of God, but today you have a majority of young people that, that not only are experiencing fear on a daily basis, but actually surveys reveal they, throughout the day, feel threatened. They actually feel threatened, like their life is being threatened. I'm not being hyperbolic. I'm reading actually the surveys, the responses. So not only is there a sense of anxiety that's intensifying, but young people feel like, oh, man, I feel threatened, right? So it's like imagine getting in your car, and there's no lines in the roads, there's no signs, there's no speed limits. You would feel a sense of constant threat. Would you, would you not? It's like sometimes my precious wife will say, I need to go to the store. But if there was no lines and there's no speed limit, I would be like, uh, I don't want you to go. I mean, it's like you, you remove the boundaries, you have chaos. Lawlessness opens the door to darkness. It opens the door to darkness. Western civilization has benefited from law. Western civilization was built, this is not hyperbolic if you're a youngster out there, by the scriptures, actually. Western civilization, highly influenced by the scriptures that determine reality, what a father is, what a mother is, male and female. When you start to rid law, you open the door to darkness. No wonder the fastest growing religion today in America is actually witchcraft. Point number two is, I think we have on the screen, is the kingdom for which Jesus is the king. Simple point is the kingdom of law, righteousness, period. And, and the disciples understood this. It's like Peter, James, and John, when they followed Jesus as Messiah, they, they had this beautiful vision. Man, one day through Israel, the Messiah of Israel, the Davidic king, righteousness will go forth from Zion. That's beautiful, original design, wholeness, shalom, beautiful. It's like the poor will be protected and the vulnerable will have, you know, God's presence in their life. There'll be righteousness, righteousness, righteousness. When Jesus said, you've heard it in times past, thou shalt not murder. Good. 
I say to you, he just raised the standard of righteousness. If you look upon another human being less than created in the image of God, you've murdered them. If you look upon a white person as white trash, black trash, Jewish trash, Arab trash, that's like, that's where murder begins, when you begin to devalue human beings. Are you guys with me on that? It's like, so Jesus actually didn't lower the standard of righteousness. He actually elevated it. In fact, when we receive communion, it's like, oh, it launches the new covenant in his blood. And that new covenant, we're getting in the weeds here, but they're good weeds, raises righteousness because you have the law written on our hearts. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. And it leads us now to the subject of Armageddon. If you go back, please, to Revelation 16. Let's look at this. Let's talk about Revelation here. It tells us in verse 14, they are spirits of demons, Remember, when you read law, you open actually yourself up to darkness. It's interesting, the Antichrist, who's a coming world leader upon the scene, who will be judged by Jesus Christ, is identified as the lawless one. Okay, so you have here in verse 14, for they are the spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Hey, whenever addressing like demonic reality and, and stuff, and I, I know there's a certain weightiness to this message, you guys. Aren't you guys glad you came this morning? <laughs> okay. Um, but I know there's a certain weightiness, but it's such an important message to address. But when you start talking about darkness and demons and stuff, there, there's two mistakes one can make. One is to dismiss that there is such a thing. The other is to exaggerate his influence. It's very important that we have balance here. There's, there's no doubt there are unseen personalities that can influence the physical realm ideologically in other ways. But I just want you to notice the pronouns here. They are spirits of demons. They. I have a lawyer friend on the front line fighting for justice and stuff. And he was just talking about just how dark it gets, man. And, I, and he used, kept using the term they, they, they. It's like they. And they attacked us and they came out. And I said, well, who is the they? And it's like sometimes we use that part, the they. Said, well, yeah, yeah, no, no. Who, who are we really talking about? When Jesus stood before a demon-possessed man to free him, Jesus asked, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. It's like Satan's pronouns are we and they. Revelation 16, verse 14, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Well, Revelation 19, 19 describes the Antichrist leading this charge. So just bear with me here. Watch, you have demonic activity inspiring the kings and the nations. There's one who spearheads this battle. I'm going to talk about it. It's, got, it's coming against Jerusalem. It's actually coming against the Lord God of Israel to replace truth with the reality that God is man, which God is not man. But the Antichrist claims to be God. He's going to set himself up in Jerusalem, in the temple, demanding the world to worship him. Very similar to the emperors of old. You know, when Jesus was born, the emperor at the time was Caesar Augustus. Caesar was the son of, or excuse me, Augustus was the son of Caesar who was identified as a god and therefore they called Augustus the son of God. And increasingly in the Roman Empire, the emperors were esteemed to be worshipped. And when you have Christianity exploding in the first century, you have, you, have this, like, you have this tension that is intensifying in the world. Our brothers and sisters of old, because who we are is who we were, and who we were is who we are. 
We're facing a totalitarian state. We're increasingly facing that actually you look at the emperor as God and he demands your full allegiance. That's why so many of our brothers and sisters lost their lives because they refused to bow. Are you guys tracking with me on this? So what happened regionally many years ago will take place in a macro level, not a micro level, macro throughout the world, the same leader spearheads a new world order. Revelation 13, a cashless, checklist society, helps to rebuild the Jewish temple. Jesus foretold it would lead to the abomination of desolation. And the Bible says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And 2 Thessalonians says, the coming, listen, of the lawless one, is according to the working of Satan. And the Bible says, because they did not love the truth that they might be saved. Truth matters. Can I hear another big amen to that? No, it's like, like there's fact-based truth. Fact-based truth is, like I drove up from San Diego this morning. Fact-based truth is, um, the, you know, there's traffic on the freeways. That's fact-based in Southern California, although there was none this morning. And, uh, that's fact-based truth. There's revelation-based truth, which God revealed himself, the scriptures. Jesus said, I am the truth. Truth matters. Okay, so it's like a generation don't, doesn't love truth. God gives them over to believe the lie, to just have this alternate reality they're being influenced by, to buy into it, to be set up to the ultimate lie. And verse 15, behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches, keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Yes, Jesus is coming, and blessed is he who watches. And in verse 16, they gathered them together to the place called in the Hebrew Armageddon. The word Armageddon is used only once in the Bible. The word itself is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew Har Megiddo, literally meaning the mountain of Megiddo, a literal tell in the Jezreel Valley of Israel, location that went, witnessed many ancient battles. It was on a highway in the ancient world. As I just mentioned, actually Jesus, when he was reared in Nazareth, was on a hill that overlooked the Jezreel Valley or the Valley of Armageddon. This battle, inspired by demonic entities gathered at Armageddon, the objective is to destroy Jerusalem. The Bible says actually one day the nations of the world will be gathered in the Jezreel Valley. But in addition to that, Ezekiel 38 and 39 describes a confederation of nations in the mountains of Israel. Isaiah 63 says some come from Jordan. We could go on and on. But the Bible says, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all the peoples. All who will heave it away shall surely be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. Point number three is this. The battle of Armageddon is inspired by demons spearheaded by Antichrist, who leads the nations of the world in an attempt to destroy Jerusalem and the return of Jesus Christ. The question is, what's to come of this demonically inspired strategy? The answer is, it's gonna be destroyed by Jesus Christ. That's the answer. No, it is. No, it is. Hey, listen, lawlessness is no one's friend. If you're like, if it's an offense to God, you're talking about like the rejection of the true and living God. That's Genesis 1. It's like the basic construct of male, female, the triune nature, you have family. It's like the rejection of that. Lawlessness is, no, okay, well, there's a heavenly father, but forget him. I'm going to eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, go outside of original design. My eyes will be open. Be like God. That's lawlessness. 
Lawlessness is the rejection. There's a genius plan that's unfolding through the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Messiah of Israel, and he's coming again, and we're going to rule away. I mean, all of that, is, if defiance to those things is lawlessness. Are you guys with me on that? And it culminates. Wrath in the Bible, big ideas, like wrath. Is God just get, is he red face? Is, is God just so ticked off? Wrath is the accumulation of godless decisions throughout history that culminate, actually. That snowball so bad that unless those days were short, no flesh would survive. Jesus returns. Those days are short. And you guys, check out Revelation chapter 19, please, with me. Look here at verse 11. I love this. Revelation 19, verse 11. I saw heaven opened. Pause right there. Heaven open. The Bible speaks of heaven in three different ways. Where the birds are, where the stars are, and where God's presence is on full display. So when it says the heavens open, there will be a demonstration of God's divine presence. The heavens will open. Behold, a white horse, he who sat on him was called faithful and, what's the next word, you guys? True. Oh, is the Lord faithful? Yeah, totally. Is he true? Man, so much for sure. He's true. He's through his promises. He loves us. He's here in our midst. He's the faithful and true one. In, watch this, righteousness, righteousness, he judges and makes, what's the next word? War. Whoa, really? Is like this Jesus really? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, what is a just war? We have our standards. Proper authority, war called by someone who truly has the right to do so. This is the idea of a just war. Just cause. Those whom we attack must deserve to be attacked on account of some wrong that they have done. Hey, look, what you're seeing in the Ukraine by Putin, you know how many people have been displaced in Ukraine? You know how many people, innocent people have been lost and women who have been raped? Over what? I mean, that's not, a, that's not wait, what kind of threat was there. I mean, oh, P Putin would say, I don't want to digress. I don't want to digress on this. But Putin would, would argue, well, there's some ideas that he's trying to fight. is isn't Westernism and lawlessness coming into his country and stuff. But wait a second, you're talking about innocent lives that are being taken in Ukraine. Are you guys with me on that, okay? So it's like, well, there has to be right intention. We intend to use our forces for good and avoid evil. War as the only way to right or wrong reasonable hope of success. Here's the point number four, is the second coming of Jesus is a war actually in the defense of Jerusalem, avenging the blood of the righteous, establishing the kingdom of law on planet earth, the epicenter being Jerusalem. Jesus judges Antichrist. He judges the beast, the Bible says, into the lake of fire. That's Revelation 19, 12 through 21. And when it comes specifically to Israel and Jerusalem, Jesus said, you will not see me again till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that will take place. In other words, Israel will see the glory of their Messiah divinely intervene and save their nation. Jesus will triumphantly Stand on the Mount of Olives that overlooks Jerusalem with all of his saints. All of that to simply say, listen, the Bible tells us one day all of Israel will be saved. That's really good news. Romans chapter 11. In other words, our Jewish friends ultimately look upon him whom they pierced, call upon Jesus, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Unless those days were short and no flesh survived, the Lord returns it's a love rescue. He comes as king. He comes as judge. He comes as savior. I love it. Yeah, praise God. It's going to happen. And point number five, and we got 25 points, by the way. Did I tell you that? No, no. Point number five is the second coming of Jesus is the salvation of Israel. In response to her turning to Jesus, saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Listen, if we ask the question, you guys, why did Peter, James, and John follow Jesus? Because they believed he was the king of a kingdom that would impact the world. 
that the law would go forth from Jerusalem. So the question becomes like, well, how does this speak to us today? You know, like, well, it speaks to us in so many ways. Does it, doesn't it like not just elevate the awesomeness of Jesus Christ? I mean, like just that whole message, does it not just bring Jesus front and center of our precious King? And we're just like, man, whoa, we're in awe of you. You not only revealed yourself, you ran us down, you revealed yourself to us, you opened our eyes to who you are, you gave us the grace to make right decision for you, forgave us our sins, same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, it dwells us, we're secure, we're gonna be in your kingdom that will never break down. It's just like, Jesus is awesome. Jesus is beautiful, Jesus is holy, Jesus is almighty God, he's the prince of peace. It's like, thank God for him, praise God for him. But listen, it also says, you guys, let's know this, Everything, everything and everyone is coming out of the closet these days. And I don't mean that in any demeaning way or devaluing of any human being. But everything is coming out of the closet, right? COVID was an accelerator. Turned the heat up. It revealed belief, the trajectory of beliefs. Everything is coming out of the closet. Would you not agree with that? It's time that Christians come out of the closet. Can I hear an amen to that? I mean, come on. And listen, it's an essential that we use our voice, my precious brothers and sisters. Your voice is important. Listen, I I got a chance to speak to a school board. I I pastor a church in San Marcos, which is North County, San Diego. But long story short, they just passed, I don't even want to get into this right now, but they they just basically passed a health framework. Did I say I don't really want to get into this right now? Okay. I don't really want to get this, but I was going to. They passed this health framework of education that I just, like, I have have six grandkids, right? That sounds like an old guy. I have six beautiful grandkids. Okay, three of which live in this community. What, What they will begin to teach kindergarten through third grade, it's like, what? You're, you're, it's like, it's like what, Dorothy said to Toto in Wizard of Oz, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. It's like, I I just can't can't believe what is infiltrating our schools. So it was like, um, you know, I had a chance to address it. We want to turn the lights on it. We want to expose it. I was trying to tell my dad, he's 92, I love him so much, best man in my wedding. And uh, he lives in Palm Desert, but he, he actually... He actually worked in Los Angeles in a large corporation. Long story short, I go, Dad, Dad, it's not, I graduated in 1982. It's not 1982 anymore. No, Dad, I'm telling you, what's happening, it's like, uh, you know, actually K through third, they will actually be teaching them that it was their parents that chose their gender. Ultimately, they, kids, kindergarten, first, second, third, you choose your own gender, you ratify. They gotta begin to actually put these things in kids' heads, and I went on and on and on. There's a lot really, really explicit. His answer was, hey, parents have no idea what, what, what uh, the kids are being done, and that's exactly right. So much of it is just like, we need to wake up and realize what is taking place in our world today. Your voice matters, that's all. Listen, what about the kids too, listen. When, when the Lord called Jonah, and he's like, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. It's like a really, really debauched place. I want, you to, I want you to preach righteousness. I'll give you a message and stuff. He didn't want to go. I mean, Nineveh was a very, very, very dark place. And he was like, no, Lord, I, I know you're a God of second chance. I go. And it's like, you give him a second chance. He was just like, I, I just want these people to be honest with you. I'm paraphrasing. I want them to be judged. It's like, I don't want them to have a second chance. So he, he ends up, Getting to Nineveh, you know the story. He gives the message. The city turns and worships God. He's bummed by it. And the the passage ends in chapter 4 by the Lord saying to Jonah, Jonah, I'll paraphrase it, what about the kids? What about the kids? Oh, you wanted them all just judge, fire come down from heaven. Yeah, yeah, but what about the next generation? What about the 100,000 kids in Nineveh? It's like I care about the next generation. And... Everyone in this room needs to 
have that same mentality, right? We are here to make a difference, not only in this generation, but future generations. God help us. And listen, guys, we're ambassadors of Jesus. Obviously, the only solution is right relationship with God in Christ. Jesus said, you must be born again. And look, no one gets to heaven unless the law has been satisfied. You're like, what are you talking about, man? It's true. No, 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 look, good people don't get to heaven. Only forgiven people do. It's like, it's called, the big term, it's called justification. Like Jesus on the cross being treated as if he committed every stinking sin in human history. The rapes, the holocaust, the killing fields, the, the pride. It just like, just all of our sin is on Jesus. He became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's like he was treated as if he committed every sin in human history. He, wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. Wage, it's, you know, the soul that sinneth shall surely die. It's our sins that separate us from him. It's like, listen, he's on the cross. He's bearing our sin. He's giving his life for us on the cross. He's satisfying the judgment of Almighty God. God is a perfect moral judge. He must judge sin. Jesus took our judgment upon himself. Hey, when's the last time someone died for you? It's like, is not our Lord awesome or what? I mean, seriously. No, really. Listen, the, the Bible says no one gets into the kingdom that will never break down unless... The law has been, it kind of gets back to the law thing. Like, wow, what do you think? No, unless the law has been satisfied. Unless like you received the gift Jesus purchased for you on the cross where he bridged the gap between God and man. It could be said with one hand reached up, he took the hand of the Father. With the other, he reaches out to every single human being. And like for me, I mean, I was on the eve of my 16th birthday and I remember my brother said, Greg, you're either for Christ or you're against them. There's no middle ground. And I just remember thinking, oh, man, I, I just, I, I knew I had sinned. I knew I needed forgiveness. I knew I needed help outside of myself. I was just a lost kid. And it's the idea that, wait a second, Jesus can be left outside of the door of my life. It, it just, in a good way, it kind of haunted me. In a good way. It's just kind of like, ah, Really? You're not for Christ, you're against him. In other words, if you don't say yes to him, you're actually against Jesus Christ. And I did that, that, that distinction was so important. Look, someone might be thinking, like this whole legal thing, what are you talking about? How do you get right with God? Number one, you need to admit you're a sinner. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And sin has been defined one way is crossing the line. And God has given us his law we're to honor mom and dad. We're to have God first. Otherwise, everything gets thrown off. We replace God with something that's created that was never intended to be there, nor, nor will it ever satisfy our life. And we've all sinned. We've all, we've all been idolaters in that way. We've, we've, we've looked to some God replacement other than God himself. We, we, we should speak the truth. We shouldn't lie. We, we should be se sexually pure outside of original design. That's a sin. And the Bible says, look, we've all sinned. And actually to sin in one area is to be guilty of it all. And the wages of sin is death. And there's a reason why Jesus was treated as if he committed every sin in human history. Why the scourging? Why the nail-pierced hands and feet? He's bearing the judgment of our sin. So I, I need to admit, it's like I need forgiveness and I need help outside of myself. Listen, in life, my friend, it's very difficult to see any meaningful change unless one is willing to face the problem. If you live in denial, now don't do that. The Bible says that pride comes before a fall, and pride would say, I got this, God. I can do it on my own. No, 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 no. There's a reason why he sent his son. So I need to admit I'm a sinner. And I need, to, I need to believe in Jesus that he hung, bled, gave his life on the cross. He resurrected from the dead. He's coming again. 
And, and number three, I need to be willing to turn from my sin. You know, I need to, no one's, no one's perfect coming to Christ. Of course, none of us are. And he, he receives us as we are. But I need to be willing to turn from sin, a self-centered life, and I need to turn to a God-centered life. Jesus said there's a broad way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. He said, there's a narrow way that leads to eternal life. Few be that find it. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except to be through me. So I need to be willing to, it's called repent. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll perish. Make a U-turn in life, and you need to receive him. He said, receive him. Yeah, he stands at the door and knocks, and if anyone would open the door, he will come in. He brings himself. And when he brings himself, he brings forgiveness. He brings hope beyond the grave. And listen, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. It's interesting. When Jesus called his first disciples, they just dropped their nets. They were fishermen. I love the picture. And they followed him. That was the right step. And I believe the Lord is calling some here this morning. I mean, maybe you've been to church a few times in your life or even to this church. That's wonderful. But have you opened the door to your heart to Jesus Christ to fill those empty spaces within? Has Christ taken residence in your life? Listen, the Bible says, I write these things that you might know you have eternal life. Not hope it or think it, but know it. Sometimes I know I'm, my precious wife is at home. I'll come home and I'm not quite sure. But if there's something cooking on the stove, you know, it's like, I know she's here, right? I know for sure. That's a sign. Well, would someone know for sure if Almighty God indwells them? You better believe it. You will know. And it's a divine interaction, transaction. And listen, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Christ before you leave here. And man, don't, don't put it off. And you know, we do too much group think. I mean, what is God saying to you? What is the Holy Spirit doing in your life? Let's, let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for everyone in this room. And Jesus, we just are in awe of you, the great King, Savior King. And I just want to pray not one person would leave here having not opened their heart to embrace you as Lord and Savior. To say, Lord, I recognize what you've done for me. I want to receive it. I want to turn from my sin and embrace you as Lord and Savior. And really, he is just a prayer away. Because the Bible says those who call upon the Lord shall be saved. So I just want to ask, please, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, how many of you say, you know, Greg, this morning I want to settle my eternal destiny. I want to ensure I'm a king's kid. I want to take that first step and embrace Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'd like to pray. I'd like to pray to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. If that's you, raise up your hand right now. And by raising up your hand, you'd be saying, yes, God bless you, I see you. You'd be saying, yes, I want to receive Christ. God bless you and God bless you. God bless you. Hey, listen, you guys, those of you that raised your hand, I'm so proud of you. Because I believe this is a divine appointment. Listen, way bigger than me. I'm, I, it's, it's, this is really between you and the Lord. This is a call not to really come to a church or come to some preacher, but to follow Jesus Christ. And I'm going to ask you, those of you that raised your hand, you wanna, you're serious. I know you are. I want you just where you're seated to stand up. And I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. Just stand up. Whenever Jesus called people, he always called them publicly. I'm not going to ask you for your name. Just stand up. There's others. You're not going to be the only one standing, you guys, because there's others standing. But if you would like to receive Christ, you stand up. There's something powerful about just putting legs to your faith. God bless you. God bless you. And God bless you. And God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? I'm just going to, you just stand, remain standing here, and I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. God bless you. Hey, I, I know what it's like to be in your, your seat, but now you're standing. Good job. Anybody else want to join these that are standing? These next few moments, I'm going to lead on a word of prayer. And this is a prayer of asking Christ to be your Savior and Lord. Pray with me, you guys, those of you who are standing. 
even if you're not, but you would like to receive Christ, pray with me right where you're standing. Pray with this prayer. Lord Jesus, I call upon you now to be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for dying for me, paying the debt of my sin. I know I'm a sinner, but I know you're a great Savior. Jesus, come into my life. Fill me with the life of God. Forgive me of all my sins. Thank you for dying for me, resurrecting from the dead, hearing this prayer, forgiving me of my sins, coming into my life, making me your child both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Hey, those of you that stood and prayed that prayer, man, congratulations. Listen, the Lord is true to his promises. Those who call upon the Lord shall be saved, right? So it's almost like, hey, did I tell you I had six grandchildren? Did I tell you that already? About 15 times, right? But it's like the conception of a child. You know, we were all conceived in our mother's womb. The DNA was in place to unfold who we already are. We just simply became who we already are. When Christ came into your life by calling upon him and turning from your sin, you're a child of God. Now you're going to bloom and unfold to become the person God has made you in Christ, right? Love it. But you need food, the Bible, Word of God, all right? We need each other. We have access to the Father in prayer. We need to give uh, love away and the truth away. Listen, before you leave here, we have, and I think we have some, oh, hey, you're Steve Wilburn's son, I think. I noticed that. You, you are? I knew that, of course. I know you since you were a baby. Okay, I love you. Um, I'm just killing playing. We know you. Okay, so, but we have a Bible for you. And uh, I want you to come pick this up because it identifies next steps of how to grow as a Christian. Hey, thank you for having me. Love you. And yeah, God bless you. And Father, thank you so much for Pastor Steve. And we pray for a great rest for him. May he have a great time of renewal. May you speak to his heart in a fresh way. And uh, thank you for this most wonderful church and staff. We're blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus from the mountain, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Oh, Jesus in the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over. Bless you, family. Have a beautiful Sunday. We'll see you this Thursday.